Winter, 1851. Madison D. Hamilton and Gardner Potter, two Manti residents, explore the area around Pleasant Creek, finding that I could provide them with the lumber needed for construction in the Manti community. Hamilton and Gardner decide to live next to Pleasant Creek to harvest and cut lumber during the winter. In the spring of 1852, under the direction of Hamilton and Potter, 12 families proceeded to move northward from Manti for the purpose of establishing a new colony. Among these settlers were Henry Wilcox, John Lowry Jr., William Davis, Seth Dodge, and John Bench. They located on both sides of the stream, just below where Mount Pleasant is now situated. The stream, now Pleasant Creek, they named Hambleton, and the settlement was given the same name in honor of the leader of the company. In early March, at the mouth of Pleasant Creek Canyon, they erected a sawmill known as the Hambleton and Potter Mill. They commenced cutting timber and sawing lumber for the purpose of building homes for the 12 families. Land was cultivated and a fair wheat crop was raised. In the spring of the next year, more settlers joined the community. In the early summer of 1853, the Indians of the Sandpitch Valley grew increasingly dissatisfied with the white settlers. Not only were their precious hunting grounds being disrupted, but increasing numbers of settlers were arriving to build homes and cultivate land. The Indian policy of friendship turned into a climate of hatred. On July 19, 1853, the Indians attacked Hambleton and tried to steal some cattle from the settlers. But guards had been posted and two of the raiding Indians were killed. Four days later, the Indians attacked the Hambleton and Potter Mill. The people of Hambleton were better prepared for this skirmish, having been reinforced with 50 men who had come from the Provo area to help fight the Indians. Six Indians were killed in this battle. After reviewing their situation, the settlers of Hambleton decided they were not strong enough to defend themselves from increasing attacks. Moreover, a proclamation issued by Brigham Young on July 25th closed small settlements due to the Indian problems. The people of Hambleton packed a few of their personal belongings and moved to the All Red Settlement six miles to the south. During the weeks that would follow, the men returned to Hambleton under heavy guard to harvest their crops and move possessions not already destroyed by the raiding Indians. By the end of summer, all the buildings had been burned by the Indians. Hambleton no longer existed. The Walker War ended the next year with 12 Mormons and many Indians losing their lives. Over $200,000 worth of damage and stolen property was recorded and several small settlements were broken up. Chief Wakara negotiated with Brigham Young and made a formal agreement to end hostilities. In 1858, exploring parties were sent from Manti to seek locations for possible settlements. James R. Ivey Sr., Joseph R. Clement, and Isaac Allred Sr. led an exploring party north of Manti and visited the site where Hambleton once stood. After looking at the Pleasant Creek area, they decided that this location would be a desirable place on which to build a new settlement. They returned to Manti and discussed with other recent immigrants their views about settling on Pleasant Creek. A petition was drafted and signed by 60 men, mostly of Danish descent, who wanted to relocate on the ruins of Hambleton. Ivy, Clement, and Allred were chosen to take this petition to Brigham Young, the ultimate arbiter of which new settlements should be colonized. They met with Brigham Young in Salt Lake City on September 6, 1858. President Young considered the petition and gave his permission, but with a stipulation that the people should continue to be on guard against the Indians and that they build a 12-foot high wall for protection. About 1,300 acres of land was surveyed, 
containing about 100 city blocks. Another meeting was called for those who planned to move to Pleasant Creek. At that meeting, numbers were drawn for newly surveyed lots. The land was distributed, further organizational preparations were made, and James R. Ivey Sr. was chosen as the president of the colony. A fort of adobe walls and log cabins was built. Sagebrush was cleared and fields were planted, wheat being the main crop. The people of the community decided to name the town Mount Pleasant because of the beautiful fields and surroundings. After 1860, homes were built outside the fort and the town expanded quickly. Excellent crops were harvested and there were two tanneries, a flour mill, and three sawmills by the summer of 1861. The town's economic base was growing. In 1863 and 1864, there were again armed conflicts between the Indians and settlers. This time, the conflict was known as the Black Hawk War. Even though the town was never involved in a major attack, the town was under constant vigilance by townspeople who filled the roles as citizen soldiers. A temporary peace was signed between military officers and some of the Indian chiefs. The signing took place at William Seeley's home in Mount Pleasant with Will Franson, a nine-year-old boy, fluent in the Indian language, serving as interpreter. Some of the first industries included tanning, shoemaking, blacksmithing, basket making, and freighting. Eventually, modernization brought such improvements as the Deseret Telegraph in 1869, the Pyramid newspaper in 1890, and a telephone system in 1891. The city was incorporated in 1868. In 1867, the first co-op store was founded, starting what became a Burgoyne commercial district. Upon the arrival of the Rio Grande Western Railroad in 1890, both the local population and the city's prosperity increased dramatically. By 1900, Mount Pleasant had grown to nearly 3,000 people, the largest size reached by any city in St. Pete County to that time, and the city had earned one of its nicknames. Hub City. The town's newfound wealth became immediately apparent in a building boom, which saw the replacement of small wooden framed commercial buildings with much more impressive architect designed stone and brick structures, such as the 1888 Sam Pete County Co op and the Gentile store, which competed with the Mormon store. The resulting Main Street District is today so architecturally distinctive that the two-block area has been listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Equally striking were the Victorian churches, schools, and residences, which replaced the simpler adobe and log buildings of the pioneer period. Among the founding settlers were Mormon converts from Scandinavia, the British Isles, and eastern United States. By 1880, at which time Mount Pleasant was the county's largest city with a population of 2,000, more than 72% of its married adults were foreign born. This ethnic diversity had an important impact on village life during the 19th and early 20th century. For decades, five languages were commonly heard at any given gathering, English, Danish, Swedish, and German, creating confusing and sometimes amusing communication problems. In 1875, Dr. James McMullen, a Presbyterian minister and educator, arrived in Mount Pleasant to do missionary work among the Mormons. His presence changed many segments of the community. James taught school and founded the Wasatch Academy, the oldest continually operating secondary school in Utah. He improved the educational system by providing competition between Wasatch Academy and the public schools, and he helped to bring a better understanding of different religious beliefs to the people of Mount Pleasant. Mount Pleasant, like most other small Mormon settlements, 
was formed by the leaders of the LDS Church, creating a strong interconnecting church community structure. There was also a great unity among the people of the town until Dr. James McMullen arrived. He brought with him the Presbyterian doctrines, which caused a split in the community, something not experienced by other small Mormon settlements for some years to come. Eventually, the different religions worked together to continue the development of the community, allowing for some diversity of beliefs. This was something the other towns in central Utah did not encounter. With the growing Protestant congregations and the increased number of lodges in Mount Pleasant, the town became known throughout Utah as the headquarters of the apostates. In the 1890s, the sheep industry and the business sector, combined with the agricultural base, made Mount Pleasant the most important commercial area in San Pete County. Unfortunately, these same factors brought a climate of lawlessness to the community. Sheriff James Burns was murdered while trying to arrest two sheep thieves. There were hoodlums and desperados in every part of town. Many of the citizens were afraid to go out on the street for fear of violence and bloodshed. The recent economic success attracted dishonest people and saloons brought an undesirable element. The law-abiding people of Mount Pleasant tried to counteract this behavior as well as the label of being the most lawless town in Utah. The LDS and Protestant churches preached higher values and the people pressured the city council to close some of the saloons. An opera house and respectable dance hall were built. These methods seemed to have worked because the lawless element were not mentioned after the turn of the century. By the early 1890s, Mount Pleasant purchased a hydroelectric plant that was placed on Pleasant Creek, about three miles up the canyon. The first electric light was installed in 1893. By the next year, electric lights replaced coal lamps in the downtown area. The Mount Pleasant Electrical Corporation formed in 1896, providing electricity throughout the town. Limited service was available in some homes by 1897. Power was turned on by 5 a.m. and off again by 1 a.m. A siren was sounded 15 minutes before the electricity was turned off. The waterworks improved a great deal during Mount Pleasant's first 50 years. Initially, culinary water was carried from Pleasant Creek. Ditches were made to bring water closer to the homes and farms. Several wells and windmills were built in the 1870s and 1880s. Mayor Carter and the city council had installed a new waterwork system throughout the downtown in 1891 at a cost of $20,000. In 1905, the City Council replaced much of the earlier waterworks with an updated system. With the new water system in place, wells were covered and the windmills taken down. The luxury of tap water was appreciated in Mount Pleasant, a town far ahead of most rural communities with its new water system. Along with the waterworks system of 1905 came indoor plumbing and indoor toilets. Before, outhouses or outdoor toilets were utilized. These toilets had been placed near the dwellings but far enough away to keep the bad odors from the house. Some were placed up to a quarter mile away. Sears and Robot catalog pages were used in the outdoor toilets as toilet tissue. The cold, long walks made these toilets undesirable. The slop jar or waste container used at night in the home was replaced by the new indoor toilets. Communications between Mount Pleasant and the outside world were originally as fast as a person on a horseback could travel. In 1865, a telegraph line was constructed through Mount Pleasant and made communications almost instantaneous. The telegraph proved especially helpful during the Black Hawk Indian War. In the late 1890s, a single telephone line was placed between Fairview and Mount Pleasant, making communications between these two towns more effective. Finally, in 1900, 
Mount Pleasant was the first town in Sanpete County to enjoy full telephone service. By 1910, Mount Pleasant had become a clean, modern town with a good water system, electricity, telephone service, and enterprising businesses. The 20th century brought continued changes and improvements for the face of the Queen City, its most popular nickname. The commercial and residential districts continued to fill with fine buildings, reflecting the prosperity of the community. By 1912, the first high school, North St. Pete, had been completed. The year 1912 also brought the Armory Hall. The Elite Theater was constructed as a fireproof building in 1913. Unfortunately, it burned down seven decades later. In 1917, a fine Carnegie Library was built in a modern architectural style. The Marie Hotel was erected in 1920, and a large cheese factory came on scene in 1930, the same year the bus service came to town. The completion of Highway 89 in 1936 was a boom needed to soften the impact of the Great Depression. A city hall in 1939 and a hospital in 1945, together with new schools and churches, gave Mount Pleasant a full complement of public buildings. Another improvement was the newly paved sidewalks in the downtown district. Later in 1925, Main Street was paved. Many of the people of Mount Pleasant saw their first airplane when it passed overhead and landed in a field north of town in 1920. Some excitement was created in 1927 when Charles A. Lindbergh flew over Mount Pleasant and landed his plane in a nearby field. This American hero, the first to fly solo across the Atlantic, was warmly received by the community. An air airport was built south of town during the Depression because of the frequent visit of airplanes during the 1930s. Mount Pleasant has long been considered the most diverse city in the county, in part because of the liberal Mormons and the Protestant groups which challenged the dominant Mormon population in the late 19th century, as well as the numerous musical, theatrical, and artistic groups, varied local industries, secret societies, and saloons. If you'd like to see more of this type of content, please hit the like button. Leave us a comment and don't forget to subscribe.